The Blinding Angel of Light, written by Douglas Del Tondo. Before going into this article, I believe who Paul actually saw was Satan, whether he recognized him or not. This article will give Del Tondo's account of this. Del Tondo begins this article talking about Paul's three vision accounts of Jesus. I don't know if this article goes into it, but one thing we're looking at is each of those three vision accounts are different. They're distinct and contain contradictory details. But we're just going to look at the moment at the blinding angel of light, that specific detail. Paul's three vision accounts of Jesus never mention anything but a blinding light and a voice. The journey is interrupted when Paul sees a blinding light and communicates directly with a divine voice. Paul never specifically says he saw Jesus in the flesh. In fact, Boltzmann contends that 2 Corinthians 5.16 means Paul did not ever meet Jesus in the flesh in Jesus' post-resurrection state. Boltman claims Paul rightly believed this made Paul's experience superior to the experience of the twelve apostles who could claim that they heard Jesus speak in the flesh and not by visions. But when Jesus went out of his way to prove to Thomas that his post-resurrection state included true flesh with wounds in his hand and his side, And in Acts, as Jesus in the flesh ascended, an angel told the apostles that in the same way he departed, he will return. This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you've watched him go into heaven, Acts 1.1. That means, as Son of Man in human flesh, Jesus will be seen by us when he comes in judgment on the clouds of glory. That means Jesus should have had flesh had Paul truly met Jesus. But Boltman says Paul insists otherwise. At least this is how Boltman, the famous theologian, reads 2 Corinthians 5.16, where Paul says, We once knew Jesus in the flesh, but no more in that way. Boltman even emphasizes this Jesus without flesh, whom Paul supposedly met, differentiates the Jesus whom Paul met from the Jesus whom the Twelve knew. So who is this blinding light figure that Paul met, if not Jesus, because it lacked flesh? Or at least it was not visible to Paul. Let's see what the Bible and commentators say about Satan as a blinding angel of light. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Isaiah 14, 12. The Hebrew word Hillel, which is translated Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 12, entered English through Greek and German. In the Greek, we have Helios, the sun god. In German, this became Helen, from which came the word Helder, meaning clear or shiny. But there is also a sense of blinding, that is, blinded by the light, in this. Thus, Hillel entered English as hell, a covered place, a place of darkness, as if blinded, a place far off from God. Hillel, when split apart, can read bright or clear God, or God of hell. The early Christian church clearly understood that Hillel was a proper noun and that Lucifer matched him not only in the meaning of the name, but also in the character. From Strong's Concordance, 1966, Hillel, a shining one. Lucifer, in Isaiah 14, 12, is the Latin translation of Hillel, which means brightness. The original Hebrew word translated as Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 12, Hillel, comes from a verbal root that means to shine brightly. See Halal in Strong's 1984. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light, written by Paul himself in 2 Corinthians 11.14. He snatches away the word of God sown in the hearts of the unsaved, Matthew 13.19, sows his counterfeit Christians among the sons of the kingdom, Matthew 13.25, 38 and 39, blinds the eyes of men to the gospel, 
2 Corinthians 4, and induces them to accept his lie, 2 Thessalonians. Often he transforms himself into an angel of light by presenting his apostles of falsehood as messengers of truth, according to Paul, 2 Corinthians 11. Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The worksmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Ezekiel 28, 12-15 I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Luke 10, 18. That is Jesus speaking. Paul claims to have continued to have messages from this Lord he met that day on the road. Are there any particular doctrines which Paul taught that proves Paul was listening to a blinding angel of light, Lucifer, and not our divine Lord, Jesus? There are two such doctrines that stand out among many examples. Paul teaches us to obey Roman rulers in Romans 13, and of course this is... Uh, extrapolated to continue to mean in the modern day, not just the Roman rulers at the time that Paul was writing, but really any earthly ruler. Treating their words as from God himself, Paul says they are God's agents, and thus Paul says our conscience must afflict us if we disobey. Yet, Jesus says the world's rulers are part of Satan's domain, not God's. In the temptation of Jesus, Luke 4, 5 through 8, Satan offers his authority to Jesus to rule the kingdoms of the world. Jesus responds indirectly to this in John 18, 36, saying, My kingdom is not of this world, meaning the kingdoms of this world are not part of his kingdom in that sense. 1918, they crucified him. This would be the, the, the ruling authorities of the earthly kingdoms at the time. Who crucified him acts 426 rulers of the world rise up against the anointed one jesus also says the sons of the kingdom we are truly exempt from obligations to them however to obey so as to not offend them thereby avoiding them to suffer anger and then sin rather than because they enjoy any holy agency from god uh, such as in the case of paying the, the tax when Yeshua got the coin from the fish. That's my neighbor's Rottweiler. See our article, Why Does Paul Say World Rulers Are God Agents? But Jesus says they are under the dominion of Satan. Paul three times teaches it is acceptable for a Christian to eat meat sacrificed to idols, which Jesus three times condemns in the book of Revelation. That's how I first figured out there's something fishy about Paul. Hence, four facts point towards the notion that Paul met Lucifer, not Jesus, on the road to Damascus. Paul admits he did not meet Jesus in the flesh when Jesus should have had flesh. The angel at Jesus' ascension told the twelve that Jesus would return in the same way as he appeared to them when he ascended. That is to say, in the physical flesh, where the disciples could touch the, the hands and see the wounds. There's no reason that if it was Jesus that came back that Paul would not have been able to have done that. Paul saw a blinding light in a vision accompanied by a voice that Paul took for Jesus, but having no way of identifying that it was indeed Jesus because Paul saw no flesh. And finally, Paul's doctrine serves Satan in two clear examples, if not many more, and indeed many more, treating the rulers of the world who Jesus says are under Satan, the prince of the world, as agents of God, and the permissibility of eating meat sacrificed to idols. Thus it appears likely that indeed Paul met Lucifer, not Christ, on the road to Damascus. Compare and contrast also that Paul meets Jesus in a light and voice appearance on earth, but John in Revelation is taken up into heaven where he sees Jesus in bodily form. 
Why did John see Jesus in heaven? Because the Lord Jesus was not supposed to return until the second coming. So who instead was on earth to meet Paul, who was bright like lightning? Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Luke 10, 18. Again, more reason to believe Paul met Lucifer, not Christ. Paul was, however, an innocent dupe. This, <clears throat> pausing the reading of the article, I've, <clears throat> I, back when, when Del Tondo still had his website, I corresponded with him. I sent him emails back and forth. Very kind guy. He always quick to respond. Uh, very um, enriching to be able to talk to him. A real brilliant guy. But I told him that I simply disagree with you on this, Douglas Del Tondo. I agree with you on almost all that you're teaching, but this, no. I don't believe Paul was an innocent dupe. That's maybe the best, most palatable spin if you're trying to first convince somebody about Paul not being inspired. You could say even Paul was fooled because he, he didn't have the spiritual discernment. Maybe that would make people more open to the concept of Paul not being inspired, but I think it gives way too much generosity and credit to a man who, prior to his conversion, had dedicated himself to uh, killing, persecuting Christians, and then after his conversion, he... Uh, <laughs> the dog wants me to pet him. Uh, after his conversion, the he still continues to pervert Christianity, to subvert Christianity, rather than just uh, attacking it, persecuting it outright. He subverts it. This is sort of like... Let's see if I can calm down the neighbor's dog. So this is sort of like if you've, if you've seen the videos of Yuri Bezmenov. He talks about the Russian strategy. Yes, they've got the nuclear option. They've got the ability to, to launch nukes and send the United States back to the Stone Age. But that's going to have consequences for the entire world. And there's probably going to be retaliation that happens. There's going to be nukes that are fired back. So the Russians, uh, the KGB especially, took a path, supposedly, of subverting American culture. And whether you want to say this is the Russians, the KGB, or the, it, it, if you want to go into some of the conspiracy theories, which I believe there are international organizations and entities and people that want to promote things that destroy Western society, so it's essentially this concept of subverting America to make it weaker rather than just attacking it and having an outright war. This is what I believe essentially Paul's genius was. I don't think he was innocent. I think he was in this regard a genius that if you attack it and you can't conquer it by attacking it, and if attacking it makes it stronger, uh, as persecution does make uh, the church stronger, the, the blood of the martyrs is is it's um i'm forgetting the expression there there's an expression that the the blood of tyrants waters the tree of liberty but there's also a similar expression in christianity that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church or something to that effect so i think paul astutely correctly like an evil genius that he was realized that persecuting the church is only causing the church to grow in, in popularity and power. The more he persecuted the church, the more attention the church got, and more and more people are wondering, why are so many people willing to sacrifice everything in order to maintain their belief in this? There must be something to it. So because the direct persecution route didn't work, they took the subversion route. Um, you know, in the case of of the supposed Russian uh, subversion or the, the communist subversion of American culture, this is the route to weaken American culture, such that uh, you know in a future such a war wouldn't even need to be fought because the country destroys itself from the inside due to its to its sin, to its lasciviousness and overall weakness. Um, I don't think that's uniquely directed at America. I see that being directed at pretty much all of the Western world, uh, especially the European countries. But 
getting back to what Paul was doing here, Paul was subverting the teachings of Jesus such that now, you know, whether a person is Christian or Catholic, pretty much what they believe is all viewed through the lens of Paul. He has successfully subverted those religions. And there's very few people, whether they're Christians or Catholics, uh, whether they still call themselves that or view themselves as Messianic or Jews or, or whatever other name, there's very few people that properly are obeying and doing the commands of Yahweh. And, uh, you know, of the people who recognize Jesus for who he is, um, there's very few that can properly see what he was actually teaching due to the subversion of Paul. So when Douglas Del Tondo writes here, I'm going to continue in the article, end of rant. When Douglas Del Tondo writes here, Paul here was an innocent dupe. That's the best possible interpretation to this. If Paul has a really good lawyer on Judgment Day, that's going to be the argument, I think, before God. Um, but I think on Judgment Day it's going to be, <laughs> I, I expect, that you know he's going to be a bit different than an innocent dupe in the eyes of the Almighty. Just my interpretation. I'm a bit cynical. Paul mistook the light as goodness, ignoring that it caused blindness, which is the mark of Lucifer's light. Jesus' light should have brought clarity, not blindness. And I'm going to come back to this uh, at the end of the article. Del Tondo has an interesting note on the comparison between the light of Satan and the light of Jesus. Does anyone have a contrary view? asks Del Tondo. Any reasons to defend that contrary view? Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 24, 5. In Matthew 24, Jesus gives a, sen a series of chronological events that lead up to the end. Some occur very early because Jesus identifies in the Shem Tob version of Matthew that the first event occurs in the lifetime of his listeners. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am he, the Messiah, and shall lead you astray. This is not the same as the false Christs who come chronologically much later and are mentioned in verse 24. Rather, Jesus is saying in the chronology of the future church history begins with someone coming in his name. And does not Paul use the name? He will say he is Jesus, or representing Jesus, but he is a counterfeit who will deceive you, Jesus says. The you means the present listeners will be led astray as a result. Thus, this is certainly an event early in the history of what Jesus says is come to pass. Where in scripture do we learn that someone told anyone in the early apostolic church that he was Jesus, but could be a deception of that person. Paul, after seeing a blinding light, encountered a voice whom Paul asked who this was, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, Acts 9.5. This identi identically fits the passage, the spirit voice came in my Jesus' name and said in substance, I am he, the Messiah. And this to me always just bothered me about Paul's conversion story. All the blinding light had to do, to do was to say, I'm Jesus. So if Paul's an innocent dupe, he's a dupe in the dupiest sense of the word for just taking somebody at their word on something that changes his whole entire life. He must have been real convincing the way that this happened. I mean, you know, heaven forbid, imagine if you're walking around and you have a sort of experience where you're blinded or, you know, something traumatic were to happen. And, you know, as, as a result, someone starts talking to you and says, you're Jesus. I mean, is your gut instinct going to be to trust that voice or to test that voice? And Paul it doesn't seem to have any doubt based upon the light being so uh, bright and, and, and blinding, just based on that alone, he's willing to accept anything and everything that this voice says and tells him to do, just based on the self-identification saying, I am Jesus. I've met brothers and sisters, and maybe not true brothers and sisters, but at least alleged brothers and sisters who believe that they're prophets, 
uh, believe that they may be a reincarnated uh, individual from Bible history who believe that they've got the Holy Spirit. One thing I like about my channel is that there are, in fact, people on this channel who do have the Holy Spirit, and I know it, and I see it. But there's also people on this channel who claim that they have the Holy Spirit, and they're saying completely contradictory things to the other people who have the Holy Spirit, and one or more people is, is different here. So, it, to me, the thing that makes Paul not a dupe, uh, it, that makes him a liar, is, is that, okay, if this person was Jesus, if this person really was who he says he was, this blinding light, and you have to dedicate your life now to this life-changing event, your, your life is forever changed, you're going to completely change the way you've lived ever before. Wouldn't the main thing you want to do to be try to get to know who that person is? At least test them and figure out through the history that's available at the time. Uh, but instead of going to the people who know him the best, the disciples, he goes away from the people who know him the best and continues to receive his revelations independently as his conversion was independent. Back to the article. Hence, the Shem Tob Hebrew Matthew, with ancient roots in the original Matthew, points to a first century fulfillment of part one of Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 24.5. The blinding light episode could have duped Paul. Could have. Del Tondo is such a generous, trusting person to believe that he was just duped. I think Paul is an evil Machiavellian demon. And through his claims, many of those in the other in the early church. So Paul, not only was Paul duped, but Paul, uh, as a result, duped much of the early church. Supplemental evidence. There is other evidence Paul unwittingly did not realize the voice he was listening to was Satan. Paul admits he has a skolos from an angel of Satan with him at all times. This is the, the flesh and the, the, the thorn in the flesh, I believe he's referring to. Paul tells us this messenger of Satan tortures him to keep Paul from being arrogant. Just my own commentary, the angel wasn't doing good enough. The angel, I mean, that might have been deserved because Paul was arrogant enough even with that. Imagine if he didn't have that, he would be even more arrogant. So maybe this was like damage control for Satan. Like Satan was going to use this guy to subvert the church. But this guy was too arrogant even for Satan. However, if Paul truly was a servant of the Creator, then why would Satan want to keep Paul from being arrogant? Satan would want arrogance and not be torturing Paul to keep him humble. Well, not necessarily. I think, um, I think maybe Satan realized that Paul really is arrogant. You look at the letters Paul writes. It's all I, 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 me, me, me. My gospel, you know, my, he takes, he puts all these personal adjectives, these, these personal nouns and so forth in all of his writing, which you don't see really in any of the other epistles or in the words of the prophets. When the prophets are, are prophesying, it's not I think or I got this message, but thus says the Lord. It's the focus is on the source. Whereas Paul, he, yes, gives credit to the source, but his writing is really all about me, me, me. So even though Satan would want arrogance, I think that Del Tondo is uh, perhaps downplaying just how much of an evil genius Satan also is. Because, you know, Satan, according to the descriptions we have of him, he was created to be the best angel that there was. So I assume he would be really intelligent. I assume he would be astute in how he does it. So I think even though in the average Joe, Satan wants to promote arrogance, you know, pride is the word of the pride is the word of my generation, basically. Pride, pride, pride. When you go to school, you have pride in your school, you have pride in yourself, you have pride in and, and the word has been appropriated by sexual perverts as well, but I mean, pride is, is the word. So I think Satan, yes, in general wants that, but as far as, as Paul is concerned, I think maybe Satan was very astute 
to try and keep Paul in line, because Paul was already over the top with his arrogance. Continuing in Del Tano's article, but if Paul's message was from Satan, then Satan would want Paul's natural arrogance toned down to be more palatable to a religious audience. Okay, I guess I just talked in circles to to say um, exactly what Del Tondo was going to say here. If Paul's message was from Satan, then Satan would want Paul's natural arrogance toned down to be more palatable to a religious audience. Okay, uh, so I guess I... I'm on the same page there. Also, in Acts, Paul encounters a demon-possessed woman popular at Philippi as a soothsayer whom people paid for prophecies. If this woman is demon-possessed and if Paul were following the true Christ, then her declaration to others to listen to Paul for salvation represents a house divided against itself. It makes no sense. But if Paul were following unwittingly a false Christ, then this makes perfect sense. Could be. Hence, this is a further confirmation that Paul was unwittingly serving Satan. In the opinion of Del Tondo. Study notes. This is very interesting. The concluding notes here, this is worth hanging out for if you're still on the recording. What does it mean that Jesus will be called the bright and morning star in Revelation 22.16? Satan had a similar but different title in Isaiah 14.12-15. through 15. In Hebrew, it means shining star, son of the morning. Uh, it also means that Satan wants to be Christ. I remember doing a study on this and being completely befuddled for the longest time because Jesus and Satan are both described essentially the same way as the bright and morning star. But Satan, he is the Antichrist, an imitation of Christ. Satan is not described as the bright and morning star as Jesus is in Revelation 22.16. Lucifer has similarities in his title, again to repeat, shining star, son of the morning, but not the same. He is a poor imitation, a poor imposter. Satan can imitate or serve as an imposter, but the flock can make critical assessments to figure out who is the true Jesus. It appears that God is sending us a subtle message that Jesus and Satan may appear the same. Jesus is a bright and morning star, while Satan is a shining star, son of the morning. They will be hard to tell apart, right? So Paul could easily be fooled by what Paul thought he was seeing as truly Jesus, when the real test was whether Jesus was seen by all people from eastern to western sky, which did not happen in Paul's encounter. Thus, the ascended Jesus and Satan could appear to be almost identical to a human if one judges by appearance. Instead, we must apply righteous judgment.